Hello students, welcome to the next edition of sales. UCC, sales of goods, UCC article two. There we are. Okay, nice to see you all. Um, in the, the uh, last edition of sales, uh, we uh, kind of closed the book, finished our study of the Battle of the Forms. Um, we've gone and from the very beginning of the lifespan of a contract, from its formation, its birth, to uh, you know, including offer and acceptance, um, to discovering what the actual terms of the contract are. I kind of view it as the contract's adolescence, uh, like kind of finding out who they are. And so the same way, if you have a battle of the forms, you need to figure out what are the actual terms that are enforceable of this contract? Um, and now we're going to kind of continue in that vein, but um, by starting a different chapter as well. And uh, the next chapter is on warranties. And it is really at the heart of Article 2. It is at the heart of consumer protections, protections for the buyer in Article 2. And it provides some strong protections. So the fundamental protections that are necessary for transactions to take place, for a buyer to have confidence in a transaction, that he is getting something, will own what he buy, he or she buys, will um, get what he or she contracted for, that it will be of, of decent quality all around. Um, it's really at the heart of uh, the protections provided by Article 2 to the consumer and the buyer. Um, but just as it's at the heart and provides uh, these very strong protections, uh, they can also be uh, taken away or disclaimed. And so we're going to think uh, there are three separate analyses I want you to keep in mind as we go through this, through this assignment on warranties. One is what are the warranties? And I'm going to explain that, give an overview of that here right now. A few seconds away. Um, what are the warranties? Uh, second question is, how do they arise? Have the um, have the warranties? The four of them, four types. Have any of them actually arisen? Some of them come in automatically. Others require that you do something, take some affirmative step, or make an affirmative statement. Um, so, first question is, what are the warranties? Second, when do they arise? And then uh, third, how do you disclaim them? So, just as the UCC, and the UCC is, tries to be even-handed, just as the UCC grants these very strong fundamental consumer protections to the buyer with one hand, with the other hand, the UCC is giving to the seller the power to disclaim those warranties. And, I, and that, um, so keep those three analyses in mind. Right? We're going to first talk about what they are, then the, I want you to master how they arise, and then how do you disclaim them, and figure out what that analysis is, get comfortable with it, and then you'll work your way right through this material. There are some pretty clear rules um, we just have to get to know them. Um, and that is the skill, this will be the skill set of, you know, working on these terms and conditions um, that uh, we looked at in a previous uh, video. Um, big part of those terms and, and provisions will address warranties and disclaimer of warranties uh, if you're drafting for the seller. So you need to understand these things so that you are properly able to ensure that the warranties come in if you are the buyer or the warranties come out if you're working for the seller. Um, so this is an important little part of your toolkit. All right, so um, one last point I wanted to make before I get into what are warranties, what are the warranties, is I wanted you to keep this that dichotomy in mind that I just mentioned, that the UCC gives with one hand 
gives to the other side with the other. Another way to look at it is the UCC, the drafters give to consumers protections with the one hand and take those protections away from the consumer with the other. Um, is that ethical? Does that render these so-called consumer protections really phantom protections? Where they have no effect because they can be easily disclaimed? In some cases, yes. In other cases, no. So we will see that as we as we work through the problem. But it it is uh, it, it often uh, I don't know. It just uh, it's one of those ethical issues of commercial law, I think. Um, anyway, we'll talk more about that as we work through warranties. We'll kind of keep that thread of thought going. But uh, let's talk about the different types of warnings. Okay, and here I've got, of course, uh, our Article 2 up. Let's see. And uh, we've gone through Part 2 and formation. And uh, it was a battle of the forms in 2207. Um, Okay, um, just had a few technical difficulties here, cleaning this up again, my apologies. But we're gonna get right back to where we were, back to Article 2. And I, um, yeah, we've uh, we've covered formation of the contract, the birth of the contract, and then and firm offers. You remember that, offer and acceptance, uh, and then a battle of the forms, um, statute of frauds, parole evidence, uh, we did uh, uh, that, um, and now we're going down, we're going to skip down to warranties, um, but uh, before we skip down, skip all of these, I want you to know that uh, we actually discussed these as well, we just didn't look particularly at them, um, but these are general obligations of the parties, I guess we could, we should, everyone should look at this at least once, but it's pretty self-explanatory that the obligation of the seller is to transfer and deliver, and that of the buyers to accept and pay. And uh, most importantly, you know, in accordance with the contract. So the, really the obligation is to conform to the contract. Um, here, uh, 302, this is another um, kind of fundamental rule to keep in mind and it'll come up as we uh, work through warranties it's a, a concept that's going to come up that um, courts can always uh, reject and delete unconscionable clauses so that's one kind of protection that's one thing you cannot contract for is unconscionable clauses and you can't enforce unconscionable clauses um, or can limit the application of an unconscionable clause to avoid its unconscionable results. So it can kind of interpret it in a way so it's no longer unconscionable. Um, but anyway, otherwise uh, unconscionable contracts, you, can, you may refuse to enforce them. Okay. Um, what else? Now, uh, and we looked at these as well, but not specifically earlier in the course when we were talking about the battle of the forms and the proviso clause, which uh, throws the switch and sends you to subsection three of 2207, which says that the terms of the agreement will uh, consist of those things upon which the writings agreed and any terms that are supplied by the UCC in the event that there are gaps. And these are these so-called gap fillers that are supplied by the 
the UCC. Um, price payable. Um, okay, it can be made payable money or otherwise. Um, it's not so much a gap filler, but open price term. If there's an open price term, um, uh, the price is a reasonable price at the time for delivery. If there is an open price term, that is, they knock each other out because maybe they have different prices on the purchase order and the confirmation knock each other out. There'll still be a contract, um, and the court will will set the price at the market price, the reasonable price, which will be the market price at the date of delivery. Um, what other gap fillers are there? Open price term. Uh, Delivery, absence of specific uh, specified place for delivery, um, unless otherwise agreed. You know, unless there is a meeting of the minds as to where delivery is. If there's a gap for whatever reason, the place for delivery of goods is the seller's place of business. So typically, um, the, uh, the means the buyer has to go pick up the goods. That's, uh, that's there is no delivery. Uh, they're delivered to the curb. They're made available, really. They're kind of tender. Um, but uh, so that's the, the general rule. There's no delivery. And we all know that. If we go and buy something, we don't expect delivery. You pay extra for delivery. And the general rule is you go to the store and you buy something, you put it in your car, and take it home. Okay. There's another gap filler. Um, specific time provisions. Uh, if there is no agreement, um, it shall be a reasonable time of delivery. So you just look at the custom. So, um, and it goes on. Open time for payment. It's going to be within a reasonable time. And if it's a credit uh, arrangement. So that brings us to uh, um, 11, 12. Now we can start our discussion of warranties. And this is where you find the provisions on warranties, 2, 312, 313, 314, 315, 316, and 317. I guess 318 as well, although that's a little bit in the weeds, third party beneficiaries. Um, so let's start uh, with uh, 312. And the first type of warranty, and that is the uh, the warranty of title. The warranty of title. Um, this is the fundamental. It's the first warranty that's provided for in the UCC Article Two, uh, and it really is the most fundamental. And it's the um, it's the warranty that if uh, the purchaser buys something, the uh, buyer will have title and, and right to whatever goods the buyer buys. And uh, you're also warranting that the, the, uh, the seller has the right to transfer title. That's part of it. So there has to be a right to transfer title and, um, and the ability to acquire full title to the goods. Uh, that's something that we all expect. You go and buy a pair of uh, sunglasses down at the corner store. Um, you expect that um, those weren't stolen and that you will have title, that the store had title and transferred it to you. Same if you go to a car dealership. Or if you buy, even if you buy, it doesn't always have to be a, um, a commercial transaction. We'll see that, and this is one thing to keep in mind, some some warranties, like the warranty of merchantability, only applies when merchants are involved in a commercial transaction. We've talked about what merchants are. Um, but um, other warranties, such as uh, the warranty of title, warranty of title, um, apply to all sales transactions, even between private parties. So if you see on uh, Facebook or these Facebook uh, groups that buy and sell things that a motorcycle is is for sale. Then you go to someone's house and you check out the motorcycle and you pay them a thousand dollars for it, and you ride off on your new motorcycle. Um, 
there was a warranty that you uh, have title to that to that motorcycle. And if it turns out it was stolen, and the sheriff comes and takes that away from you, and they locate it, and uh, comes and seizes it and gives it back to its rightful owner, you'll be able to sue the seller, whoever you bought it from, for a breach of warranty of title. Um, so that's how this kind of plays out. So it applies to commercial transactions, but also private transactions. Let's uh, look a little more closely at the actual language. Uh, there is in a contract for sale, and that is absolute language. You know, it doesn't say a contract for sale between merchants. No, it says in any contract for sale, there is a warranty by the seller that the title conveyed shall be good and it's transfer rightful. Okay, so that's the black letter law there. Um, and nothing has to be done. It, this is one of the warranties that uh, arises automatically. So again, there are kind of three aspects of warranties that I want you guys to focus on. What is the warranty? Here it's the warranty made by the seller that um, and these are all made by the seller, all of them. Um, it's a warranty made by the seller that transfer of title will be good. And it, so that's the nature of it. Um, and then the, uh, how does it arise? Automatically. Um, how is it breached? Uh, I mean, maybe we should have four or uh, thinking about it, maybe a, think of it in four dimensions. You know, what is the, the nature of the, the warranty? Um, how does it arise? How can it be breached? And how can it be disclaimed? I want us to understand all those things. So here with the warranty of title, it's a warranty the title shall be uh, properly conveyed. Uh, it arises automatically in any sales contract. Uh, it is breached if it turns out that the buyer does not acquire title. Um, and disclaimer, um, we'll look more closely at all of this stuff, uh, more closely at disclaimer uh, as we go through the problems. But briefly stated, disclaimer is very difficult with respect to the warranty of title. The, the drafters make it very difficult to have this taken away from buyers because this is such a fundamental uh, expectation in, in commerce. Whether I was going to say modern commerce, whether it would be ancient commerce as well, it's all commerce that you're going to have title to the thing that you buy. So the drafters make it uh, very difficult to disclaim that consumer protection but they do make it possible. And I will teach you the art of disclaiming it. If you want to disclaim it, you can disclaim it. Okay. Um, there's one other aspect of the, of the nature of the warranty of title. Um, I think the foundation of it is that you shall have title to what it, uh, whatever it is you buy. But there's, a, there's another part of the warranty that the seller makes that the goods shall be delivered free from any security interest or any other kind of lien or encumbrance. But really, this is the important part, free of any security interest of which the buyer at the time of the contract has no knowledge. Because you don't wanna buy a motorcycle and think that you own it outright, but really the seller is still is supposed to make payments on it and then stops making payments after you buy the motorcycle from him. And now the bank locates the motorcycle and sends a repo guy out and, and uh, repossesses it, which they totally have the right to do. You can go and sue your uh, seller for the breach of the warranty of title because it also protects against any security interests because it, it, it ends up being the same thing. Um, the motorcycle gets taken away from you, either by a bank um, or by the police if it's stolen. So in either of those situations, you have a case under the warranty of title.
Now, before I go any further, I want to give a kind of a broader overview. I like to give broad overviews. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to get back to the warranty of title because it's the first part of this, uh, of this uh, assignment that we're going to be taking a deep dive into. But I want to give you a broader overview before we head into the problems on um, the warranty of title. Warranty of title is one of the warranties. The four, four types I told you. Warranty of title is one. Uh, another one are, is uh, express warranties. It's another type of warranty. And those are different from the warranty of title in that it doesn't, uh, express warranties do not arise automatically. You have to make a promise or a statement, take some act as a seller to create the warranty, such as these golf clubs are made of pure titanium or carbon nanofibers. Well, if you say that, um, then they better be made of, of pure titanium or carbon nanotubes, nanofibers. Um, because otherwise, uh, if it turns out they're just made out of uh, steel, well, then you've breached this express warranty you've made, this promise. Right? Those are promises that are made. Um, that's an express warranty. Um, those are also very difficult to disclaim. So like the uh, warranty of title, those are very difficult to disclaim because it's just so foul and devious for a salesman at the golf store saying, you know, you, please, you should buy this, this thousand dollar driver because it's made out of the latest carbon nanofiber. And I say, great. And he takes me to the desk and has me sign the little slip of paper. And on that, it says, we hereby dis, uh, disclaim all express warranties of whatever make, nature made by whomever uh, prior or upon the purchase of this item. Should, and, then I, and then I go uh, and uh, take down the golf course and I discover it's made out of cheap steel. Should the store be able to get away with that? So to lie with you on one side of their mouth and then, uh, and then disclaim all liability for to the other side? It's so nefarious that the drafters made it really very difficult and the courts have made it even more difficult. They've really interpreted the law in ways that resemble uh, um, judicial gymnastics. They really bend over backwards to prevent stores from acting this way, sellers from acting this way, because it's, it's so deceptive. So we've got the warranty of title, we've got the express warranties, and then we have two more, which are known as the implied warranties. The implied warranties. And um, the first one is the warranty of merchantability. The second one is the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Warranty of merchantability, it arises automatically uh, when a merchant is involved. So if you buy something at a store, you're gonna get a warranty of merchantability. Um, and it basically says that it's whatever you buy is of average quality, of at least average quality and it's fit for its ordinary purpose. So that I, if I go to Ikea and I buy a wooden chair um, and I take it home, but it's made of like the lightest pine wood you can imagine. It's like balsa wood and I, I sit on it, you know, a big guy and I sit on it and it just cracks and smashes and I fall to the ground and hurt myself. Yeah, I'm gonna sue Ikea for the breach of the warranty of merchantability which arose automatically um, because this was not fit for its ordinary purpose. Its ordinary purpose is for a man. Yeah, I'm a, a big guy, but I'm, uh, I'm not like obscenely obese. Um, it should be, I should be able to sit down on any chair you buy in a US furniture store. And if you can't, if it falls apart, that's not average quality, that's substandard quality. But I like the, um, so we're going to remember, we're going to dive deeply into all of this stuff again. I'm giving you an overview, but um, 
just so you start seeing the different kind of themes and relationship and similarities between the different uh, warranties. It's, I just want you to get the full picture. Um, unlike the warranty of title and the warranty, uh, the express warranties, the warranty of merchantability is very easy to disclaim. Um, as is the, uh, the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. The implied warranties, warranty of merchantability and fitness, very easy to disclaim. For example, you can disclaim them simply by writing the words as is. Four letters, A-S-I-S, -S, as is and uh, it obliterates um, both of the implied warranties. But it, has, it does nothing with respect to title or the express warranties. So this is the kind of thing we're gonna be learning, you know, how all of these warranties work and then what you need to do as a lawyer to draft them uh, or draft your provisions appropriately in light of all of these rules in order to serve your client's interests. That's the trick. That's our job. Um, so what else should I say about this? Ah, yes. Um, I always found it a little bit confusing that um, the warranty of title was not included in that group of implied warranties, uh, but it's not. And because, you know, I felt that feel confused by it because it is implied. The warranty of title is always implied. It's automatic. Um, and in fact, the warranty of fitness, it, it isn't that automatic. It requires uh, certain elements. So it's, I don't really think that it's so much implied. Um, it is somewhat implied. I'll talk to you about it. I'll describe it in a second. But a uh, warranty of title is just boom, automatically implied. Well, that goes into every sales contract, sales of goods contract. Um, so it's just one of those technical definitions that you just need to, I don't want you to be confused like I've been confused in the past. Whenever you see the, the phrase implied warranties in the UCC, it's referring only to the warranty of merchantability and the warranty of fitness. It's not referring to title. Like we'll find out, we'll see uh, in 9316 that you can disclaim all implied warranties with the words as is. That does not mean that the warranty of title can be disclaimed by the words as is. No, only the so-called implied warranties, which are the warranty of merchantability and the warranty of fitness. So hopefully that makes things clearer and not more complicated. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Um, I contrasted to the um, warranty of fitness or the warranty of merchantability in this way. The warranty of merchantability I think of as requiring that something is fit for its ordinary purpose. Warranty of fitness for a particular purpose is a, a warranty that it's going to be fit for a particular purpose or even an extraordinary purpose. For example, if I, um, if I buy a chair from Ikea and I, I uh, go up to one of the uh, employees there and say, hey, I'd really like to buy a chair and I really like to be a sturdy chair because I plan to use it kind of as a stepping stool in my library at home to reach those really high shelves. And so do you have anything that's good for that? And they say, hmm, okay, well, yeah, sure, uh, sir. Let me um, show you uh, a couple of chairs I have in mind. And he takes you to a couple of chairs and, and you say, okay, terrific. Thank you very much. And and you buy one of them and you take it home and the first time you step up on it to reach a book, you topple over because the way it was designed was not designed uh, to have that high center of gravity or something. And so it loses its balance, topples over, you break, I break my hip, I sue Ikea. 
under breach of the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose because they had reason to know of my particular need and I relied on their recommendation because I rely on these people to know what they're talking about, be professionals. So if they know of a particular need and, uh, and then I rely on their recommendation and it doesn't uh, fit that need, I can see. Let me give you another great example. It's a per one of personal experience and I, one that really surprised me and uh, I was really impressed by the salesman that I worked with. And this was at um, Home Depot. This is a few years back, although I have it here in my studio. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you this little story here. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, I was at Home Depot, and uh, I was shopping for some wire uh, for to run an electrical current. And um, what I was building was something called a Jacob's Ladder, which uh, you may see have seen in like old 50s uh, horror movies with mad scientists, where they would have these uh, upright kind of V-shaped wires and a bolt of lightning would run up in between them and it would like shock and bring Frankenstein to life or something. So I'm building one of these, it's like Victorian electric novelty. It's a big box, big wooden box that I built. And then I put this um, transformer from an old neon light uh, sign in it and ran the wires up to this V-shaped copper tubing that was about two feet high. And then plugged it in and flipped the switch and that transformer kicked up the voltage to 10,000 volts. And then it created the beautiful blue arc of lightning. Um, very dangerous stuff. I don't recommend it. Don't, don't do that. But um, anyway, while I was building this thing, I needed some heavy duty wire that could handle 10,000 volts of electricity. So I went into Home Depot and I went over to the wire section, the hardware section, I found the spools of wire and I was looking at it. And then I asked someone there, I said, one of these uh, gentlemen in the orange aprons, and I said, um, can you recommend some wire for me? I've been working on a project at home. He's like, sure, well, let me know. What do you need? And I said, well, you know, and I told him just what I told you. I'm, I need a wire that's going to handle 10,000 volts so I can create this incredible um, bolt of lightning in my garage or in my studio. And, um, and he looked at me and he said, no, sir, we have nothing that will be able to handle that. And that was brilliant, because what if he just told me, oh, I'm sure, well, but you probably should use our highest duty uh, cord right here, this wire, this, this thick wire. And, he, and then I go and say, thanks, sir, awesome. That's just what I needed to know. And I buy some, and I take it home, and I run the 10,000 volts through it, and it bursts into flame and burns down my house. Um, I would be able to go back to them and say, hey, I relied on your expertise. I told him what I was doing. He recommended this wire. I relied on his professional judgment, and my house is now a heap of smoldering ash. And they would have to pay up, unless they properly disclaimed a warranty of uh, fitness for a particular purpose. So that's kind of a quick overview of all the warranties. Uh, and once you master these rules, and I think you've already absorbed uh, some of them, the basic outline of them, or we're going to revisit these things again. Uh, in the next uh, meeting, uh, this, this class and, and the next meeting as well, um, I think you'll have a pretty good mastery of the material. So let's move on to uh, the problems and the one case, the more case, which uh, 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 showed how difficult it is to disclaim the warranty of title. Um, we have three problems to do, problems 21, 24, and 26. Okay, we're turning now 
on here. Turning now to the problems in the Moore case regarding the warranty of title. So let's jump into this here. Trying to fine tune this. Okay, and uh, let's take a look at the book. There we go. Okay. Um, back on track. Okay. So we're starting our uh, starting the problems with problem 21. Sellers can sometimes evade or disclaim. The warranty of title. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. You can disclaim. Theoretically, you can disclaim all warranties, but some are extremely difficult. Determine if the warranty is present in the following situation. This is another way of saying determine whether they were properly disclaimed. If not properly disclaimed, then the warranty will, uh, will come in. Uh, the sales contract has this clause. The product is sold as is, and the seller makes no warranties expressed or implied as part of this sale. As is. The seller makes no warranties expressed or implied as part of the sale. Well, let's, um, let's take a closer look at the statute. Um, so is the uh, same statute that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. um, 9312 uh, discusses the nature of the of the of the warranty, but also discusses the how to disclaim it. So let me share that screen. Okay. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at section one of 312. Now we get to a warranty under section one that is a warranty of title will be excluded or modified only by specific language or by circumstances which give the buyer reason to know that the person selling does not claim title in himself or that he is purporting to sell only such right or title as he or a third person may have. Um, and the question in this problem is, uh, well, what about if the language is just as is? Um, that is not specific language. Well, you know, what is meant by specific language? Um, but this is certainly not it. Um, and as this comes up later uh, in the context of the implied warranty, where it is in 9316 explicitly stated that the use of the words as is, um, disclaim all implied warranties. So if the drafters wanted to say that as is would do it, they knew how to say that. And they clearly uh, intended uh, that the warranty of title not be disclaimed by those words. Um, let's see if I can I'm try to share my screen. It's easier for me to switch back and forth. Um, let's see how I want to do this. Do this, okay. I do it. Oh no, that's out of control. Okay. No, 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 no. Stop. Um, okay. Um, I can just share a screen this way. All right. Um, so let's look uh, at the at the textbook. 
go on to be. Repossession Motors sold a car on credit to a customer who returned it after failing to make the first payment. It then conducted an Article 9 type resale. Does the resale buyer get the benefit of the two 312 warranty? See official comment file. This is getting a little bit on the fringes of uh, sales law, but uh, the idea is this, uh, that uh, um, the answer will be uh, uh, yes, that the buyer will get the benefit of the warranty of title. And the debate, and this had been um, debated, had been the subject of litigation, but it's pretty much settled, and now it's, I think it's explicitly understood in both Article 9 and Article 2 that um, just because you are buying, for example, an automobile at an auction and it's been repossessed from a drug dealer uh, that was seized by a bank and put up for um, auction because they enforced their security interest uh, uh, in the car because the uh, drug dealer owed them money. Um, um, whoever bought that car can still rely on the warranty of title. It does not amount to um, what is referred to here, circumstances that give the buyer reason to know the person selling does not claim title in himself. And that's what, that's what some auctioneers, auction houses argue that um, a little figure here. Some uh, auction houses argue that uh, if you buy something at an auction and it's repossessed, then you should know that mm, we're not sure whether the title is good or not. And so that should be enough to disclaim the warranty of title. And you can't sue us if uh, it turns out that that car was in fact stolen. Uh, you can't sue us for the breach of the warranty of title. Um, but the uh, law has developed and the uh, court decisions have developed to apply, to allow for, uh, or to allow for the warranty of title to continue to apply. Um, and that those circumstances do not disclaim an article, just the fact that it's in an Article 9 auction, it's not a disclaimer of the warranty of title. Um, if the law had gone the other way, it would have been a big blow to a major um, pillar of our financial economy, which is the ability of banks, lenders, creditors to rely on a security interest and to extend loans and sell things on credit and to rely on the, the strength of the security interest that they will be made whole. But if the, if, um, um, if people don't feel comfortable buying at auctions, then people aren't going to show up at the auction. And the money generated at auctions is going to is going to go down down. So this um, this evolution of the law has uh, reinforced confidence in buyers at Article Nine auctions. You go and buy a car there, you'll pay the a, a high price for it because you at least know that yes, you're going to have title to it, or you can sue the auction house for breach of warranty of title. So you're happy to pay a you know good market price. Um, if you didn't have that certainty, you'd be like, oh, I'll pay you 50% of the market price if you're not going to guarantee that you have title. I'm not going to take that risk, and, you know, pay you top dollar. So let's go on. That's not it. Uh, here we go, Ted Traveler. Okay, this is the same sort of uh, idea, um, but one that probably do, does amount to the disclaimer of the warranty of title. And that is if you walk into the men's room of a bus depot and you buy a, a watch from someone um, and then uh, it turns out that, you know, it's not a a uh, working watch, it's not a Rolex or something, or, it's, or it turns out it's stolen. And the police uh, see you coming out of there and they say, hey, give me that watch. That was stolen from a guy that just arrived on the Chicago train, the Chicago bus. 
uh, and they grab it from you and they tell you to get out of here. They don't sue you, but you're, you're out of your money. You paid 50 bucks for that Rolex. And uh, can you go and sue that guy? You see him and you grab him and you get his name out of him and his driver's license. Uh, can you take him to court and sue him to get your 50 bucks back? Um, and he could argue, Your Honor, uh, Professor Sundahl should have known better. It's obvious that uh, these are very shady dealings in the back in the bathroom with the bus depot, and that should be sufficient to put everyone on notice that there is no warranty of title, Your Honor. And uh, I think I would tend to agree with him. It's a uh, it's a weird hypothetical, but it kind of does illustrate the. Uh, the idea. It's very rare that you that you are in a situation where you don't expect a good title. I mean, you've got to be involved in some kind of really shady dealings. Um, but, you know, typically, it's not an issue. But um, here's a case, the Moore case, about uh, this uh, issue of how do you disclaim the uh, warranty of title if you want to do it and in this case we had a car lot protein corvette sales which was in the 90s uh and mr moore bought a 74 corvette sweet like green car uh and then he turns out that it was stolen in texas and uh, it was eventually seized the michigan state police subsequently confiscated the car returned it to to texas so there, there you go he's out of the car the police can take it, and the rightful owner has the right to possession. And you now have the right to turn around and sue Protein for the uh, breach of the warranty of title. But what does Protein say? But uh, hey, look at the uh, the contract and our little sales agreement that you signed. You know, before you gave us the money and uh, you took off with the, the Corvette. It says that it's sold as is. And so this is, you know, one of the line of cases that says this is not, as is certainly, does not extend to the warranty of title, which requires um, <clears throat> um, here we talk a little bit about the, um, but it requires specific language. And here it, the court turns to this uh, previous case, Jones Linebaugh. Um, held that very precise and unambiguous language must be used to exclude a warranty. So basic to the sale of goods as is item. It's a rather stuffy way to, to say it, but um, I think that's right. It's a, a very precise and unambiguous language, specific language, making clear that the warranty of title is being disclaimed. But is even that enough? to say specifically in bold letters, conspicuously, um, that uh, the warranty of title is hereby disclaimed. That sounds specific. I don't even say it's precise and even unambiguous. Um, but is even that enough? The court went on to say that um, um, language is ineffective if it is couched in negative terminology. The simple statement that um, there shall be like, and, and this was the phrase that was being litigated, the seller should in no wise be liable upon any guarantees or warranties, including the warranty of title. Okay, that sounds like a very specific, precise, unambiguous uh, disclaimer of the warranty of title. But the court, the Michigan Court of Appeals still held that's not enough. We need something even more. And I think the court is um, really uh, interpreting the law uh, in a way that's very demanding on sellers, makes it difficult. Because I think this would in the, fulfill the black letter law, but the court goes beyond that and says, no, that's not enough because it's couched in negative terminology. Um, and what does that mean, negative terminology? Expressing that the seller will not be liable. 
says the seller will not be liable for a uh, breach of warranty of title. That's not enough. That is, um, um, that's not enough. Instead, you need to say something positive, not negative, how you're limiting your liability, but something about the buyer, something positive, I guess, about what the buyer, about the, the liability that the buyer is undertaking. I, I, I think it's even clearer to say, you gotta say something about the, the buyer, not about the liabilities of the, the seller being limited, but about the buyer taking on this very heavy liability that he or she will bear the risk about whether or not the seller even owns this car. Um, that is what is, uh, uh, the court is saying here. Um, uh, we have, um, Yes, and this is the, the form. This is the suggested um, yeah, This is the uh, suggested uh, language uh, that the court suggests. If you do want to um, indeed disclaim the warranty of title, which I, I don't recommend you do automatically it should be a really good reason because it's um i don't know if i would read it if i were going to buy a motorcycle and i saw that in the in the uh contractual language i would never sign that i'm not taking that risk um but you can do it and if you want to do it this is how you do it just talk, talk about the risk undertaken by the buyer here the seller makes no warranty as to the title to the goods and uh, buyer assumes all risks of non-ownership of the goods by the seller. That's what you want to say. You want to talk, say, hey, buyer, not only is, is this a disclaimer of my liability, but you're taking on a huge risk. It's like a big wave and a red flag. And that's the kind of language that uh, the court requires. So it's very difficult. So remember that. If ever you want to do it, you need this little tool. This is your toolkit. Going to say something about the buyer's risks. Um, you can do it if you want, but again, this is the only way to be sure, and uh, and I don't necessarily recommend it unless you have good reason. Okay. Okay, now let's move on to the next problems. Uh, the next problems 21 and 24 deal with express warranties. Uh, we're finished with the warranty of title and everything we need to know, both the, you know, the nature of the warranty of title and the disclaiming of the warranty of title, it's all there in 312, which is a nice little package. And I think we understand now the, the nature of the warranty of title, uh, what it, is uh, how it's breached, how it's disclaimed. Um, and now we move on to the next set of warranties and that is express warranties. And uh, they do not arise automatically. It requires some affirmative action. Um, that could be, you know, most likely it's a promise. Um, I promise you that this, um, this lawnmower will last for five years. Um, or uh, I promise you that this, uh, the chassis of this lawnmower is made out of very high grade aluminum. Well, if you uh, make those promises, uh, you've created an express warranty and those promises should be enforced and this is how you enforce them. You say that those promises are express warranties and as we saw uh, in the very beginning of this part of the UCC 9301, um, that the obligation of the parties is to conform with the contract. So if um, you created an express warranty, you need to stand by that warranty. And if you don't, it's a breach of warranty. And if it turns out that the chassis of that, um, 
of that uh, lawnmower was in fact made out of cheap steel um, that got bent out of shape really easily then um, and was really heavy and hard to push, then that would be a breach of that warranty. And you could probably get your money back. Um, so that's an example of an express warranty. There are other ways to create express warranties. Uh, so, but why don't I share my screen? I think I found a, a new way to do this that is a little easier, but let me test it. We'll take a look at the, yeah. take a look at the statute here. And uh, we looked at 312, that's the warranty of title. Now we're going to express warranties, 313. And um, all right, and it says right off the bat, express warranties by the seller. Again, these are all warranties uh, that the seller creates are created as follows. Any promise, any affirmation of fact or promise. Affirmation of fact is just a statement of fact. You know, that, oh, you, you'll, uh, uh, I want to show you this lawnmower because it's made of the highest grade aluminum. Mm, that's the affirmation of fact. Um, and that'll create an express warranty. It better be made of high-grade aluminum then. Um, but uh, it takes more than that even. It's a little more nuanced. Um, the uh, seller has to make an affirmation of fact or a promise. So the seller has to do something. Um, but the buyer, <clears throat> um, it has to uh, become, it relates to the goods. That's, that's pretty straightforward. It has to become part of the basis of the bargain. And that has really goes to the, the mindset and the action of the buyer. So both parties are, are involved in the creation of an express warranty. The uh, seller has to promise something, but then the buyer has to actually rely on that promise. Um, if, uh, for example, uh, the salesman said, oh, I wanna show this, um, this lawnmower to you, it's made of the highest grade aluminum and, uh, and I buy it, um, but I buy it just because it's the cheapest thing. It's the cheapest model uh, on the lot and that's why I buy it. And I, I really didn't even remember what he said about it being aluminum. It didn't make any difference to me. I didn't care. Um, then the seller could say, hey, you didn't rely on that statement. So you can't, it's, a, it's not right for you to come back and enforce it against me because it had nothing to do with his decision to buy this. So um, that is one argument that can be made to uh, disclaim, to ward off an attack of the breach of an express warranty. That's one way the seller can attack it and say, no, it, because it, it didn't go to the basis of the bargain. The, buyer did not rely on my promise when making the decision to buy. But that really depends on the facts, uh, you know, of course, like everything else, as to whether that would work. But that's what you look for, an affirmation of fact or promise, and it becomes part of the basis of the bargain. That is the, the buyer relies on it when deciding to purchase the item. But there are other ways to create express warranties. Uh, by just describing the goods, any description of the goods, that's a warranty. If it goes to the basis of the bargain, that continues to be required. But if you subscribe these goods, if you go up and say, uh, oh, look at this, this set of golf clubs, they're all made of, um, of nanocarbon tubes, uh, then you've described the nature of these uh, um, uh, of these golf clubs. Uh, you've described them and uh, you have to stand by your descriptions. It's very similar to promising something. It's really just a different uh, way of um, making a statement about the nature of the goods. And then the, the question is whether or not the buyer relied on it. So a promise or an affirmation, a description will do it or see any sample or model. If you, uh, Maybe you're a door-to-door -door salesman selling golf clubs and uh, you uh, knock on the door and you just have uh, one sample of your big Bertha uh, super futuristic carbo nanotube uh, driver and you go knocking door-to-door in uh, golfing communities and you say, hey, take a look at this. This is a, 
a uh, golf club that I'm selling. And uh, if you sign the dotted line right here, uh, it'll be yours for $500. And it'll arrive in two days. Um, and um, what did the, the uh, seller do there? By showing a sample or a model. Well, this was, I think, a sample because it's actual size. Um, the, uh, the actual golf club that the buyer receives in the, in the mail two days later better be the same as the sample it was shown. If it, if it uh, looks totally different, it's made out of different materials, whatever, um, then you can sue for a breach of an express warranty that was created by showing the sample. A model is typically a mock-up. Um, here with the golf club, the, the, the uh, hypothetical was an actual golf club that was used, and that's more of a sample. A model is when you use something that isn't the real thing. It isn't a working operating item. Uh, for example, in the olden days, uh, these door-to-door -door salesmen used to go around selling appliances like refrigerators and ovens, these big iron ovens. Uh, but they wouldn't want to carry around giant ovens, so they carried little models that were made out of uh, lighter materials and were just a, like, a, like a toy size. And um, some people collect that stuff, in fact. But that would, by showing that at the door when you're selling your appliances, that's a model. And when the actual oven arrives, not two days, but probably back then, you know, like six weeks later, um, it better uh, look just like that model. If not, they can sue for a breach of, warrant, of an express warranty. So know these um, methods of creating the express warranty. Um, and then it says here, it's not necessary to use any magic words or any special words. You don't need to say warrant or guarantee, you know, just by showing a model or by describing something you'll create an express warranty. You don't ever, you can't, the seller can't ever say, oh, I never used the word warranty or guarantee. I never warranted anything. No, that's not the question. The question is whether you made an affirmation, a promise, a description, or presented a sample or model. But in all of these, I'll remind you, there's always that second step um, about whether there was reliance, whether it went to the basis of the bargain. So keep that in mind. And um, with that, let's, uh, let me uh, turn the slides off. Um, I should probably make my head a little smaller, get out of the way some. Now we're going to look at the, uh, um, at the turn to our first problem, which is uh, 21, I believe. Uh, so let's try this, 24, why don't I move over here, yeah, that's good, I'm kind of out of the way, all right, that looks good, um, now, okay, that's 24, but we want to, um, I think that's right, we're starting at 20, no, I think we're going up to 21 first. Or am I wrong? We'll be starting with 24. I will, uh, let me just double check this. I got 21. Yes, no, okay, 24 to 26. Okay, now we're at problem 24. Uh, which is our first problem regarding these express warranties. So uh, let's look at the, uh, the facts here. The salesman at a uh, lot of smiles pre-owned vehicles told the woman buying the car that it was an A1 shape. Okay, out on a used car lot, pre-owned, great euphemism, pre-owned. Um, so this is an A1 shape car. So she bought the car, but it broke down the next day, stranding her in the country. Was this oral statement mere puffing? Ah, puffing. What is that? Is that like vaping? What is puffing? 
Um, it's an old English term. Uh, the the noun, uh, the nominal uh, version of it is puffery, um, and that this goes to the question of whether uh, a statement made by the seller goes to the that goes to the basis of the bargain. Is it a statement that an, a reasonable buyer would really take to heart and rely upon when buying a, an item? So that's the question here. Or is it something that should just be ignored? It's just um, uh, exaggerations, just opinions of uh, meaningless opinions of these used car salesmen that no one would ever take into consideration when deciding to purchase an automobile and everyone knows it. And so the court even says, hey, everyone knows that you don't make a decision um, on the basis on the basis of what used car salesmen say. So that's puffery. So, um, and how do you distinguish between what is puffery and what is not puffery? And if it's not puffery, then you have an argument that, and it, that it went to the basis of the bargain and that an express warranty should be, uh, should be found, which you can then sue on for the breach. Um, how do you distinguish between uh, puffery and express warranties. I've made a list of four, four categories, four items, four uh, criteria. One, um, so express warranties are are often measurable. The more measurable um, a statement is the more likely it's going to be an express warranty. For example, if uh, you know, looking at this, um, A1 shape, what does A1 shape mean? Is there some uh, grading of automobiles that is overseen by a, an organization and A1 has a technical meaning that it is it meets certain criteria? Or is this just, a, just something that everyone says and it has no meaning whatsoever. It's like you're A-OK -okay, or this car is super cool. Um, it's an A1 shape. Um, it's not measurable. It's not measurable. So I would say it leans towards puffery. Is it realistic or is it unrealistic? Like uh, if, if the car, if the salesman says this is the greatest car in the world. Um, it's like of course it isn't the greatest car in the world. It's totally unrealistic. I'm going to ignore him. He's just being a, uh, a cheesy car salesman. Uh, that's, that's totally unrealistic. But if someone says, you know, this car um, was got a new engine in 1959, well, that's something that you could probably confirm. Um, and it's um, kind of measurable and determinable. And it's realistic. Um, specific versus vague. If you say, uh, um, uh, this car is wonderful. That's very vague. What does that mean, wonderful? But if you say, uh, this uh, car just passed a 20 point inspection by a third party uh, mechanic. Well, that is a uh, pretty specific. I mean, the brakes were looked at, the fluids were looked at, the uh, steering, the, the tires, um, and it passed all this ins inspection. You know, this is a more specific thing rather than just wonderful. Wonderful is very vague and nebulous. So these are just ideas to help you kind of conceptualize the difference between puffery and um, an enforceable express warranty. And I, I put it together myself this afternoon, uh, but I thought it was a helpful list because that's kind of how I've been looking at, at this uh, issue through the years. So in this case, I think in all of those, uh, for all of those reasons, I'd say A1 shape is mere puffery, doesn't mean much at all. Um, is it an easier case if the seller tells the buyer that the used car is in mint condition I would argue yes, then there's an easier decision, a, a, a more likely result that it will create an express warranty 
because mint condition has a more technical meaning. It means basically untouched, unused, that it was rolled out of the factory and put right into storage. And I think that that's a generally accepted term, even a technical term. I mean, you do some research and you could probably find that it has a technical meaning with respect to fine car um, dealerships. Um, it certainly does with respect to coins. Um, so that would be my, my reaction to that. Um, let's keep rolling here. That was 24. Oh, it was B. Yep, when the farmer looked over the young chickens, he was contemplating purchasing of the poultry company. He complained that they looked pretty scruffy. Yep. So the salesman explained that that was because they were on half uh, feed and that when they're placed on full feed, once uh, they were purchased, I guess, uh, they would they would bloom out, straighten up, and fly right, and they would do a good job in your chicken house. Um, what does that mean? Is that puffery? Is that measurable? Does that have any technical meaning? Is it uh, specific or kind of vague? Um, another thing they look for is, is it fact? Is it a statement of fact or is it of opinion? The more it's like an opinion, like uh, if the salesman says, I love this car, uh, that's opinion, and that's going to be puffery. You disregard personal opinion. Um, here, maybe you could cast it as personal opinion. You know, I, I thought they will, I think they're going to bloom out, straighten up, and fly right. Um, but maybe the uh, biggest problem I see with this language is that it's kind of vague. Like, what does it mean? And it's kind of immeasurable. What does it mean to bloom out, straighten up, and fly right? I mean, chickens don't really fly. But what is he talking about? And they do a good job in your chicken house. I mean, I, that's, if I were arguing that side and trying to get it dismissed, if I was uh, you know, arguing on behalf of the, the poultry company who's being sued by the farmer for breach of this express warranty, I'd say there's no express warranty, Your Honor. I mean, these words mean absolutely nothing. And uh, no reasonable person would rely on them, for, certainly. And they wouldn't go to the basis of the bargain. They're vague. This is this is puffery. Um, so that's um, kind of how those arguments go. Um, they started dying in droves, and can they can they uh, argue? And the question is whether it's going to be puffery or not. Um, I also like to think that there is a duty. Um, um, but there should, if I were to argue the other side, I would say that, that there's some obligation, there is some warranty made. If you say that the chickens are going to do a good job in your chicken house, that should mean something, that they should at least not be dying in droves. I mean, they should be surviving and, you know, thriving and, and growing until the slaughter or whatever the plans are for these chickens. Um, they shouldn't die in droves. It may not be the greatest chickens in the world, but if you say that they're going to do a good job, well, they, they shouldn't die in droves. Is it, shouldn't it mean something? That's how I'd argue the other side. Um, but um, I think the more likely result is that this will be deemed puffery because it's such weird, vague language. All right. I'm going to, we're just going to uh, finish this. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop there because I've gone beyond the uh, 100 minutes for the uh, for the week. So we're going to pick up here uh, at uh, part C with Portia Moot. So let's end there. I've given you guys a lot to think about. And let's see. All right. And um, I will be seeing you. Um, again on Monday. Okay. Looking forward to it. Have a great weekend, everyone.